American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcast. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today, we're talking about a site we're actually going to visit next August when we lead a pilgrimage to the Kentucky Catholic Holy Land and Bourbon Country, Gethsemane Abbey, the first Cistercian Trappist Monastery in the New World. Yes, I am looking forward to that pilgrimage. After enduring 2020, I need lots of prayer and a drink. So going to the cradle of U.S. Catholicism west of the Appalachians, which also happens to be the cradle of Bourbon, is perfect. And Gethsemane Abbey is an integral part of that story. It sure is. The abbey itself was founded in 1848, when 44 Trappist monks came to Kentucky from the Melloray Abbey in France. But the connection of that place to the church goes back many years earlier. Right. The 2,000 acres of Gethsemane Abbey were purchased from the Sisters of Loretto, who ran a boarding school there. But they had moved off the property by the time the Trappists arrived, and Bishop Benedict Joseph Flaget helped the two orders work out the deal. But the Sisters of Loretto weren't the original Catholic occupants of the land either. No, the Sisters were founded in 1812 and didn't use the land until 1824. Before they were on this land, there was another band of Trappists and a French-American missionary priest. There is so much going on here. Yes. So Father Stephen Baden purchased the land in the 1790s. Father Baden was from France, and he was the first Catholic priest ordained in the United States. He served for many, many years as a missionary in Kentucky and up into the Northwest Territory. He also owned extensive tracts of land, a fact which eventually brought him into conflict with the first bishop of Bardstown, but we'll talk about that another time. So in 1805, Father Baden invited some Trappists who came to America to establish a permanent monastery on his land. They made a go of it, but a season of very bad floods dampened their enthusiasm. So they left in 1809. You see what I did Damn. there? <laughs> no, I saw what you did there. Okay. <laughs> Before we go further, let's talk about Trappists, who they are and what they're all about. Right. So, St. Benedict of Nursia wrote a rule of life and founded a number of monasteries and abbeys. Benedictine abbeys are all independent institutions. There is no global leader or governing body of the Benedictine order, as there is with the Jesuits, Dominicans, or the various orders of Franciscans. These Benedictine monasteries became some of the most important institutions for the structure of society throughout Europe between the 5th and the 16th centuries. Learning, technological innovation, scientific discoveries, and preservation of culture, these all happened in Benedictine monasteries. Over the centuries, some, well, most, of the monasteries became less careful about following the rule of St. Benedict. Things got really comfortable and, you know, less prayerful. Finally, at the end of the 11th century, a group of monks at the Abbey of Malem in France decided they wanted to actually try to live the life St. Benedict prescribed. So they left Malem and established a new abbey. This new abbey was near the French city of Citeaux, which is called Cistercium in Latin. Because of this, they became known as the Cistercians. Right. So now the Trappists. Well, the Trappists were Cistercians who thought that the Cistercians over a few centuries had gotten a bit too fat and happy. In the mid-17th century, the abbot of the Cistercian Abbey at La Trappe in Normandy decided that his monks needed to live a more austere life of manual labor, prayer, and penitential practices. So he instituted a reform of life for his monks. His reforms spread from La Trappe to a number of other Cistercian abbeys, and the abbeys where the, the reforms were adopted became known as Trappists. The Trappists who ended up in Kentucky in 1805 did so because of the French Revolution. And this is a theme we've seen, that disastrous revolution in France gave us many great Catholics in this country. Indeed, and the Trappists were driven out of their monasteries in France when the French government confiscated all church lands. Some of the monks from La Trappe established a new abbey at an abandoned Carthusian charter house in Valsan, Switzerland. But just a few years later, 
the French invaded Switzerland and the Trappists were expelled a second time. It was during this time of wandering looking for a new home that the Trappists came over to Kentucky in 1805. And we've already mentioned how that went. Yeah, and for the record, we're mentioning a lot of orders here. Carthusians are also a religious community, but they are not Benedictine in any way. No, the Carthusians have their own rule written by their founder, St. Bruno of Cologne. They also have one of the coolest mottos, Stat Crucis Dum Volvitor Orbis. The cross stands steady while the world turns. But anyhow, back to the Trappist and Kentucky bourbon country. Did we mention we have a pilgrimage coming up to the area soon? I think we did. But, you know, it bears repeating. Details at pilgrimages.com slash Catholic Kentucky bourbon. It's going to be great. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. So eventually the Trappists over in Europe were able to reestablish monasteries in France, including at La Trappe. By 1847, the Trappist monastery at Melloray was so full, the abbot sent monks out to go see about founding new monasteries elsewhere, and Kentucky was one of those destinations. Bardstown had been made a diocese in 1808 with the French Dominican Benedict Joseph Flaget as its first bishop. He was happy to receive the two monks, and as mentioned, he worked out a deal with them to purchase the land from the Sisters of Loretto. The land was, by this time, already known as Gethsemane. One year later, in 1848, the 44 Trappists arrived under the leadership of Father Eutropius Proust. They arrived in Kentucky on December 21 and had a rough first winter. Their luggage was held up in a warehouse and the cabins left on the property by the original Trappists and by the sisters were not suitable for occupation. So they tore them down and built new ones. Then when the summer rolled around, they had to deal with a Kentucky summer. They actually petitioned their mother house for dispensations regarding their habit such dispensations had only been considered previously for monasteries in Africa, but seasons in Kentucky were not like seasons in France. Winters are much more cold and icy, while summers are much more hot and humid. But they persevered and flourished. In 1851, Gethsemane was elevated to the rank of abbey, and Dom Eutropius Proust was made the first abbot. This earned them the title of Proto-Abbey of the New World. Right, and this was a close thing because they weren't the first Benedictine monastery in the United States. No, St. Vincent in Latrobe, Pennsylvania was established as a monastery in 1846, two years earlier than Gethsemane. But St. Vincent wasn't elevated to Abbey until 1855. So St. Vincent was the first Benedictine monastery, but Gethsemane was the first Abbey. The number of monks grew steadily. They began a proper monastery structure in 1852 in a beautiful neo-Gothic style. Dom Eutropius had to resign as abbot in 1859 due to poor health, and Dom Benedict Berger was elected the second abbot. Dom Benedict was a multifaceted man. For one, he was much more austere and rigorous in his observance of the Trappist rule than was Dom Eutropius, and because of this, new vocations pretty much flatlined. None of the new postulants who came over opted to stay. Now, you said none who came over. Yes, because the Abbey didn't have an American join the order until the 1880s. They were all still coming over from France. But Dom Benedict had some good qualities, too. He was a shrewd businessman, and under his leadership, the Abbey significantly increased its revenue from farming their own land and leasing some of their land to local farmers. Also, during the Civil War, he was kind and generous to soldiers of both sides, thus keeping the Abbey out of harm's way. Though he definitely favored the Union forces, and they knew it. Right. Dom Benedict also saw the completion of the Abbey Church, which was consecrated in 1866 by Archbishop John Baptist Purcell of Cincinnati. So with a beautiful monastery building, the Abbey Church consecrated, the farming established pretty well, and the Civil War over without any real damage to the Abbey or its property, it seems things at Gethsemane were going pretty well. Yes, and in the 1880s, they received their first American as a postulant, a former cowboy from Texas. He must have decided that roaming free across the wide open plain wasn't nearly as desirable as staying put at a farming house of prayer in Kentucky. But this is real life, and this is the church. So problems wouldn't stay away forever. Nope. In the 1890s, the third abbot, Dom Edward Shea Bourbon, yes, his last name really was Bourbon, hired a new schoolmaster for the boys' school, which he wanted to turn into a college. The problem was the teacher they hired apparently had some issues with keeping his hands to himself and being inappropriate with some of the boys. 
Dom Edwards seemed not to act quickly enough when the problems were reported to him. When he realized that he'd lost the confidence of the monks, he fled to France to tender his resignation at the mother house in Melloray. His resignation wasn't accepted at first, but, apart from one brief two-day return to Gethsemane, he remained in France the rest of his life. So Gethsemane was without its abbot and didn't hear anything from the mother house in France for three years. Right, until Melloray sent Dom Edmund Obrecht, and then things changed. Obrecht was a transformational figure. He became abbot in March 1898 and remained abbot until 1935. Under Obrecht, the abbey undertook many construction projects, which gave the abbey its present layout. He instituted many rules and policies which still guide the life of the abbey. Basically, he stabilized the abbey and built it up to be a place of prayer and work for many years to come. Dom Edmund Obrecht died in 1935 and was succeeded as abbot by Father Frederick Dunn, who had served as prior, basically the executive officer, if the abbot is the commanding officer, under Obrecht. Dunn's tenure saw the next major innovation in the history of Gethsemane, and this one really put the abbey on the map. Dunn wanted to carry on the construction and innovation of Obrecht. One of his ideas was to ask two particular monks to write books that would help people see the world from a Trappist point of view. One of them was Father Raymond Flanagan, who wrote 20 books, a number of which were very well received, and he became very well known. The other, however, changed everything. That was Father Thomas Merton. Yes. Father Merton had the religious name Lewis, so he's frequently put down as Father Lewis Merton, but it's the same guy. Merton, of course, is known for his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, and for dabbling in Eastern mysticism. He wrote 50 books, achieved international fame, and then died suddenly in Bangkok, Thailand when he was there for a conference. But due to his writings, the Abbey experienced a tremendous growth in interest. The number of monks reached its peak in 1952 at 279 monks. The exploding numbers caused Dunn to send monks out to found some daughter houses in other parts of the country, including the first two in Huntsville, Utah, and in Conyers, Georgia. And then, under the next abbot, James Fox, the first was in South Carolina. This abbey in South Carolina has a story all its own. Yes, this one was established at Mepkin, which is a unique name, and listeners of this podcast may remember that name from episode 61 when we talked about Claire Booth Luce. Mepkin was the South Carolina plantation that the Luces had purchased as a getaway. They donated the land to Gethsemane Abbey in 1949. Eventually, both Claire and her husband, Henry Luce, were buried on the grounds at Mepkin, near the graves of Claire's mother and her daughter from her first marriage. Their graves are still on the grounds of what is now Mepkin Abbey. There have been other Trappist monasteries established by monks from Gethsemane, including in Genesee, New York, Milflores, Chile, Vina, California, and one in Spencer, Massachusetts. The one in Spencer is about 20 minutes from where I grew up and is the only one that brews beer, something that the Trappists are known for over in Belgium and France. And it is delicious. Now I want to do a pilgrimage to Spencer. Huh? I think we could do that. Yeah, maybe over Christmas. Got a case to join before we bring lots of people. Anyhow, Dom James Fox oversaw significant changes to the Gethsemane physical plant in the form of renovations to the buildings. For reasons known only to him and God, he decided that the neo-Gothic structures should get a facelift. So much of the lovely ornamentation was stripped away, and things were reimagined in a 1950s brutalist mode. As we near the present day in our narrative, we need to mention the retreats that the Abbey puts on year-round, plus the opportunity to spend time just visiting the Abbey grounds, and, of course, Gethsemane Farms. But Gethsemane Farms isn't a farm these days in the way it used to be. No, the monks no longer farm the land to be a self-sustaining community. Their primary source of income is from cheese, fruitcakes, and bourbon fudge, which they produce. And they sell these things through mail order and online. We'll have the links to their sites in our show notes. Mm, bourbon fudge. That sounds amazing. Mm. Makes sense they'd sell bourbon fudge. They're located right in the middle of bourbon country. Some major distilleries are within just a few miles with their property. And we're going to be visiting all of it next August. We'd I love to have everyone join us on this pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. <laughs> I think we've said that a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gethsemane is one of the reasons this region is known as the Kentucky Catholic Holy Land. 
It's one of the many Catholic foundations in a very small area. An area that happily coincides with where that uniquely American spirit, bourbon, grew up. Yes, happy accident. (laughs) Providence. (laughs) Yeah, probably. So nowadays, Gethsemane has about 40 monks active with many laity working in various roles to help the upkeep of the buildings and helping to run Gethsemane farms. The monks continue to be engaged in various interreligious functions, and they continue to host retreats. The grounds at Gethsemane, first in the hands of Father Stephen Baden, then the Sisters of Loretto, and for the last 170-plus years in the hands of the Trappists, are into their third century of service as a place of peace, prayer, and meditation for all who visit. Find out how you can visit with us at pilgrimages.com slash Catholic Kentucky Bourbon. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And support the many productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. To learn more about Gethsemane Abbey or to find previous episodes, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster-Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Music.